the American food supply is at risk. Most of it is being outsourced to other countries. So big farms can grow monocrops like corn. You're paying for it. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Corn, corn, corn. America loves its corn. America grows so much corn, we don't know what to do with it all. But we're growing it anyway, and it's a major problem. And that's why for breakfast, I eat Magic Spoon. I always loved eating cereal as a kid, and as an adult, I haven't stopped. The problem is, mm, a lot of cereals out there are full of sugar and corn. Not Magic Spoon. It's delicious, but it's also low carb, keto friendly, gluten free, and corn free. And you'll see by the end why being corn free is so important. And you want to eat Magic Spoon too. So, anyway, the US is by far the largest corn producer in the world. Over 360 million metric tons of corn were produced by the U.S. alone in the past year. That's more than 2,000 pounds of corn a year for every man, woman, child, and DJ in this country. I don't consider DJs people. But that's still not enough. Farmers are increasing corn yields every year thanks to technology like nitrogen fertilizers, chemical pesticides, advanced machinery, and genetic modifications. And when I say thanks to, I don't actually mean thanks. There are some big problems with those, which I'll get to later. But my point is, America grows a lot of corn. We also grow way too many sugar beets, soybeans, a few other crops, but even more corn. But it's not like Americans are each eating 2,000 pounds of corn a year. Well, not most of us. But the farming industry in the U.S. has gradually gone from small farmers growing a huge variety of crops to a few large farm owners growing single crops. It's the big agricultural industry, called Big Ag for short. And Big Ag is growing so much corn because A, it's cheap to do it on a large scale, and B, and this is the key, corn is heavily subsidized by U.S. taxpayers. Taxpayers didn't vote on this, by the way. If taxpayers were given the option, I think many would choose a different crop to subsidize. The 2018 Farm Bill is the most recent of the farm bills that pass about every five years. It provides loopholes that large farms can use to grow even more corn. In 2020, corn growers received at least $9 billion in taxpayer supports through bailouts, commodity protection programs, disaster relief, conservation programs, subsidized crop insurance, and trade disruption compensation payments. Critics say big ag in the United States has little to do with supplying people with needed food and much to do with using political force to perpetuate profits at the expense of consumers and biodiversity. To be fair, most food in America isn't needed. I'm looking at you, Little Caesar's crazy calzone. The Center for American Progress, a left-leaning think tank, says the 2018 House Farm Bill is silent on steps to enhance competition or protect fairness in markets. And according to the Rural Advancement Foundation International, the Farm Bill essentially gutted subsidy payment limits for the big guys. This change opens the door for large farms to get larger and will drive further erosion of mid-scale farms. The National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition warned that exempting most corporate farms from those payment limits would mean 10% or more of the nation's commodity farms would be eligible for unlimited subsidy payments. And guess who's lobbying Congress to continue these unlimited subsidies? Why, it's Big Ag. Last year, Big Ag spent more than $130 million lobbying Congress, which is a great investment. Spend $130 million on lobbying, get $9 billion in subsidies? Well, I think it's time America Uncovered did some lobbying in Washington. Does anyone have $130 million they could give us through Patreon? But in the meantime, 
taxpayer money going to the wealthiest farm owners isn't the biggest problem. I'll show you what is after the break. Welcome back. Throughout decades of subsidies, the U.S. government has essentially been paying farmers to produce corn. And guess what happened? Farmers started producing too much corn. And by too much, I mean more than Americans can eat and more than those companies can export. So Big Ag came up with an idea. Why not push the use of corn in a bunch of other things? So that's what's inside hacky sacks. But on a much bigger scale, corn is used, and I know this will surprise you, for corn syrup. In 1965, scientists invented high fructose corn syrup, which is made from cornstarch. By the 1970s, American companies were marketing it to replace sugar. Now you see it everywhere, from candy bars to soft drinks. Strangely, that's also when America's obesity epidemic started. Probably just a coincidence. Corn can't make you fat, right? <laughs> but even after making all that high fructose corn syrup, there is still too much corn being produced. So Big Ag started pushing its use in animal feed. Cows in this country used to eat mostly grass, and corn fed wasn't all that common. But over the past few decades, ranchers have switched to feeding their cattle a mostly corn diet. Cows' diets are cornier than Carrot Top telling knock-knock jokes at a corn concert in Nebraska. Corn is cheaper to feed cows than grass, and it makes them fat quicker. It even improves the marbling in the meat. That means you, as the consumer, get cheaper meat with more fatty deliciousness. The only downside is all the downsides. Corn-fed cows are a lot less healthy. They tend to develop digestive problems that make them sick, they get liver abscesses, and they're more likely to get urinary stone. Plus, corn-fed cows are more likely to get E. coli infections, which can be passed on to humans. Basically, unhappy cows. And nobody likes an emo cow. Always listening to moo chemical romance. But even after feeding corn to millions of cows, there's still too much corn left. How about fuel? Starting in the 1970s, Big Ag started pushing the use of corn-based ethanol in gasoline. Ethanol fuel wasn't a new idea, but the timing was perfect, since the U.S. was suffering from an oil shortage at the time. And George W. Bush wasn't in office yet to propose his usual solution for getting more oil, invading Iraq. Eventually, a series of laws, starting with the Clean Air Act in 1990, began requiring the use of ethanol in gasoline. Most gasoline you buy now is a blend that includes 10% ethanol. That's something Big Ag lobbied for. But that doesn't mean ethanol fuel is better for the environment. Higher ethanol blends of gasoline still produce significant levels of air pollution, reduce fuel efficiency, jack up corn and other food prices, and damage car engines. Plus, they make your car fat. It's also a really poor use of land. The cultivation of corn for ethanol now requires a staggering 38 million acres of land, an area larger than the state of Illinois. In other words, the U.S. devotes enough land to corn ethanol production to feed 150 million people and countless DJs. And growing so much excess corn is bad for the environment. It ruins soil and water quality. Continuously farming only one type of crop in one specific area also known as monoculture, degrades soil structure and leaves it more vulnerable to erosion, resulting in costs for soil replacement, cleanup, and lost farmland value. In response, farmers apply manure or synthetic fertilizer, but too often this washes into waterways, where it feeds algae blooms that create dead zones or pollute drinking water. But who needs water when you can just drink high fructose corn syrup? <sighs> Mmm, I can feel my liver. Wait, that's probably not good. Major farming states like Iowa run along the Mississippi River. All that waste flows to the Gulf of Mexico, creating a dead zone where algae blooms destroy the ecosystem. That kills marine life and, by extension, the local fishing economy. But don't worry, we can just switch to eating corn sushi. <laughs> this is a real image, by the way which lets you know how big of a problem this really is. 
So taxpayer subsidies pushed by big ag have led to the overproduction of corn, which is wrecking the environment and possibly making people and animals sick. That's a good start. But are there any other major problems? Of course there are. Right after the break. Welcome back. While big ag is taking over American farming and growing way too much corn, sugar beets, corn, soybeans, and more corn, the production of more diverse crops is dwindling. When it comes to growing crops, America is all ears. America has so much corn, it's making my jokes corny. More and more of the food in your local grocery store is imported from other countries, except Chobani Greek yogurt. That actually comes from Idaho. I think they only call it Greek yogurt because Idaho yogurt just sounds like another name for mashed potatoes. To keep fruits and vegetables available year-round, the U.S. imports almost two-thirds of its fresh fruit and one-third of its fresh vegetables. The U.S. is the largest market for imported berries worldwide. A lot of fruits and vegetable imports come from Latin America, especially Mexico. And here I thought the most valuable Latin American crop brought into the States was cocaine. You may remember weird Super Bowl ads like this. Avocados from Mexico. Which upset Donald Trump, who said some of these avocados coming from Mexico are criminals, drug dealers, rapists. They're not sending their best. It's not just avocados. Mexico accounts for over half of U.S. fruit imports and three quarters of U.S. fresh vegetable imports. Plus, Mexico accounts for 50% of all tomato imports. Although there's some debate about this. Some people say tomatoes are a fruit. Other people are wrong. Imports from Latin America are attractive to Americans because the region has a tropical environment for fruits and it's cheap thanks to low labor costs. I mean, the hourly wage for an American farm worker is a day's wage for a worker in Mexico. Now that's value. For you, not for him. His life sucks. Other than Latin America, the U.S. imports food like cucumbers and bell peppers from Canada, and ginger and garlic from China. In fact, nearly 60% of apple juice sold in America, including big brands like Mott's, now come from China, a country not usually known for its apples, but definitely known for cheap labor costs, sometimes even zero labor costs. Now that's value. For you, not for them. Their lives suck. But forget cheap labor, and possibly slave labor. There's also a massive carbon footprint of transporting food from 7,000 miles away. Now, according to the Office of the United States Trade Representative, United States agricultural imports benefit consumers with lower prices and expanded choices. Those expanded choices don't apply to farmers, though. Their choices are still corn, 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 and corn. And according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, moving imported products to consumers supports jobs in the data processing, financial, legal, management, administrative, marketing, and transportation sectors. But a job gain for some can mean a job loss for others. Family farms in America have had a hard time competing against cheap imports. And believe me, I know a little something about being an American having a hard time competing against a cheap import. Meanwhile, Big Ag is buying out family farms that used to grow a diversity of crops and using that land for subsidized monocrops like corn. And now that America has outsourced a huge part of its food production to other countries, what if the supply chain breaks? Like if there's a war, or if, say, there's a global pandemic and governments worldwide shut down parts of their economy, hypothetically speaking. I wonder why food prices are now 40% higher than a year ago, the highest seen in a decade. Food security is a huge potential problem, unless you want to have corn sushi for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. During World War I and World War II, the U.S. government encouraged people to grow their own food at home, in what they called victory gardens. But now, most Americans don't know how to grow anything, well, except pot. By relying on imports and reducing self-sufficiency, America has gradually put itself in a dangerous situation where we could lose access to a huge diversity of food. Of course, if things get really bad, we can always eat 2,000 pounds of corn a year. But hopefully not. 
if you order from our sponsor, Magic Spoon. I love Magic Spoon because it tastes amazing and doesn't contain any of that nasty GMO corn. It's almost too good to be true. It's got zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Also, only 140 calories. The fruity flavor is amazing, but they also have other ones. Matt, give me more. They've got peanut butter, frosted, cocoa, and a bunch of other ones Matt needs to order for me. If you're on a keto diet, Magic Spoon is perfect. But even if you're not, and you're just trying to cut corn or other grain out of your diet, you know, after watching this video, you should definitely try Magic Spoon. They've really figured out the magic balance of being tasty and way healthier than other cereal. So click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code UNCOVERED at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com uncovered. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Also, for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon is now also shipping to Canada and the UK. So click the link below and use the code UNCOVERED or go to magicspoon.com slash uncovered and save $5 now. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.